This week on Jerusalem Dateline, from COVID-19 to the Abraham Accords to Aliyah, we'll take a look at some of the most important stories of 2020 that will continue to affect Israel and the Middle East in 2021. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. and welcome to this special edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl filling in for Chris Mitchell. As we begin this new year, we'll take a look at some of the most important stories of 2020, most of which will continue to have an impact on Israel, the region, and even the world in this coming year. The COVID-19 virus that has rocked the world left Israelis ending 2020 and starting the new year in their third lockdown. Though there are some differences, Israelis know the drill and were out in droves the day before doing last minute shopping and visiting. The closure will go at least one week into the new year. Israelis have had mixed reactions to the lockdowns, which have left more than 20% of the population unemployed. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu kicked off a massive vaccination campaign. In less than two weeks, more than three quarters of a million Israelis were vaccinated. That's more than those who have actually had the virus in Israel. In a surprise move, 35 years after he was arrested for spying, ex-U.S. Navy analyst Jonathan Pollard and his wife Esther landed in Israel. The Pollards, who flew on a private plane, kissed the ground when they arrived. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu welcomed them at the airport and said a Jewish prayer for special occasions. He also gave Pollard an Israeli identity card. This is a really moving moment that Jonathan and Esther returned home. It's so good they came home. So we say, who has given us life, sustained us, and brought us to this time. Pollard is the only American in U.S. history to receive a life sentence for spying for an ally. He's also the only one to serve more than 10 years for such a crime. He was released in 2015 and finished parole in November. For the fourth time in two years, Israelis are heading to national elections after the government collapsed in December. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell explains what happened. The Knesset was dissolved automatically at midnight after the deadline expired to pass a 2020 budget or a bill to extend that deadline. We need to say that we're in a complicated period with multiple challenges with multiple conflicts. It appears to me that there is not an end of the conflicts in the public and also naturally in this building. During the last seven months, the short-lived coalition between Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party and alternate Prime Minister Benny Gantz's Blue and White party was plagued by mistrust and infighting. To my great sorrow, we couldn't find enough in common in order to prevent another election and in order to allow the 23rd Knesset and its members to realize the mandate that was given to us. Earlier, Netanyahu and Gantz blamed each other for the government collapse. Apparently, blue and white, including its people who are going to vote here, are going to drag us into unnecessary elections. I want to tell you that I'm not afraid of elections. We're prepared for that. We will win. I had no illusions in regards with Netanyahu. I knew his record as a serial promise violator. The upcoming elections are scheduled for March 23rd. According to opinion polls, Likud will still have a lead over other parties, but Gidon Sar's New Hope Party and Naftali Bennett's Jewish Home Party will also draw a large following from the right. Those polls show Gantz as the big loser, with his blue and white party winning just five to six seats in the 120-member Knesset. Adding another twist, Netanyahu's corruption trial is set to begin after the first of the year. With a possible third COVID lockdown on the way, and all the mudslinging, analysts say this could be the toughest election Israel has ever seen. On a much more positive note, from August until the end of the year, four Muslim nations made peace with Israel in what has become known as the Abraham Accords. The UAE and Bahrain took the first historic steps and were joined by Sudan and Morocco in a move attributed to President Trump and his senior White House advisor, Jared Kushner. CBN's White House correspondent, Ben Kennedy, takes us to Washington, where the first agreements were signed. President Trump calls the accord peace in the Middle East without blood on the sand. This is also a diplomatic win for the commander-in-chief ahead of the November election. We're here this afternoon to change the course of history. A historic peace deal dubbed the Abraham Accord. 
signed on the South Lawn, establishing full diplomatic ties between the key allies of the U.S. Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain will establish embassies, exchange ambassadors, and begin the cooperate and work together so strongly. Let me start by conveying the best regards of the UAE people. The UAE became the first Gulf state and third Arab nation to agree to diplomatic ties with Israel. Bahrain signed on last week. This day is a pivot of history. It heralds a new dawn of peace. For thousands of years, the Jewish people have prayed for peace. For decades, the Jewish state has prayed for peace. We can see before us a golden opportunity for peace, security, and prosperity for our region. The agreement should add security to the region and is seen as a major step towards peace in the Middle East. To be Jewish, to be an evangelical, and to be there watching it unfold, this is, this is prophetic, it's historic, it's exciting, and it's personal for me. I've had two sons serve in the Israeli military, and I want them to have peace. Under the agreement, Israel agrees to stop annexation plans for part of the West Bank, land sought by Palestinians for a future state. <laughs> Israeli military says two people were injured after rockets were fired from Gaza during the peace signing in D.C. The Palestinians condemn the deal and consider it a stab in the back. We want the Palestinians to come to the table, but we can't want peace more than they do. And so um, uh, to date, uh, they have reacted uh, badly to our proposal. They've reacted badly to uh, our peace agreements with the United Arab Emirates and with uh, Bahrain. And um, uh, it's, it's a huge mistake by the leadership. Now President Trump says there are at least five other countries in the Middle East that are tired of fighting and ready to join the circle of peace. If Saudi Arabia were to follow suit, this would have major implications for Lebanon, Syria and Iran. Another possible game changer for Israel in the Middle East was the presidential election in the U.S. in November. Take a look at the profound changes a Biden-Harris administration might make in policy toward the Middle East. Sunday marked the third anniversary of President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. To celebrate, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu put Trump's declaration alongside President Harry Truman's recognition of the newly born state of Israel in 1948. These two historic proclamations will never be forgotten. They'll never be forgotten by the Jewish people and by the Jewish state. They will be cherished for generations. However, there are concerns that some of the advances made by the Trump administration could be changed or even reversed. So far, Joe Biden has indicated he would likely keep the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem if he becomes president. But what about other Trump policies in the Middle East? Michael Oren is Israel's former ambassador to the U.S. With respect to Iran, uh, both the former vice president and his running mate, Senator Harris, have said unequivocally that they intend to renew the Iran nuclear deal of 2015. If Iran returns to the levels of uranium enrichment established by that deal, it's not very difficult for Iran to do. And that means lifting sanctions. And that has profound ramifications for Israel in the Middle East. Netanyahu also noted other positive moves made by Trump on Israel's behalf. You recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. You recognize Israel's legitimate rights in Judea and Samaria. You proposed a realistic peace plan that acknowledges those rights and maintains Israel's ability to defend itself. You forged the historic Abraham Accords. Oren believes a Biden administration would not invest in those accords the way the Trump administration has. I don't think they're gonna invest money, for example, in building the Israeli-Sudanese peace because that belongs to the, the Trump era. And again, the emphasis will be on the Palestinian issue and not on the Abraham Accords. On the Palestinian front, Senator Harris has embraced a return to negotiations with the Palestinians and stated, we are committed to a two-state solution and we will oppose any unilateral steps that undermine that goal. That signals opposition to building in the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank and restoring funding to the Palestinian Authority. From Tehran to the West Bank, it's clear a Biden-Harris administration would set a dramatically different course than what President Trump has for the past four years for Israel and the Middle East. Coming up, 
Even the COVID-19 pandemic can't stop the Jewish people from coming back to Israel. <music> 2020 was definitely a tough year, but it had its blessings. Despite the coronavirus bringing country lockdowns and cancellation of flights, more than 20,000 immigrants from 70 countries moved to Israel this year, fulfilling prophecy. Here's a story we did earlier in the year about the Aliyah, or immigration, and the expectation that it will increase in the coming years. While the special festivities that usually welcome these immigrants called Olim are on hold, you can see in these images people are still completing their journey. Aliyah never stopped to Israel, and it doesn't stop now, even with the coronavirus. For 72 years, we are bringing Olim to Israel, and we are continuing to, continuing to do it. Nefesh Benefesh helps bring these immigrants from North America. Most of the Olim that are coming have uh, begun their planning stages a long time ago. People are seeing the pandemic stretching from both sides of the ocean. I think it was giving them a lot of security to come to Israel where they feel that the uh, crisis is being managed as best as possible. Svi and Aviva Karoli came from New York with their children, Lani and Adi, although they faced an immediate 14-day quarantine. We caught up with them by video during their isolation. I mean, we didn't specifically plan on coming during coronavirus. It just, we plan on coming in March and it happened to be, and we're just weren't gonna change our plans. We don't know in the world what's gonna be happening two weeks from now, three weeks from now, three months from now. So why delay? There's no better place to be than Israel. Despite everything, we took the jump and we came. Neighbors who they didn't yet know left food outside their apartment and brought toys for the children. There is never a perfect time but it's always the right time. And to just come here because the people of Israel are wonderful. David Parsons says the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is helping bring in people from Russia and Ethiopia. Some Jews are saying, look, Israel seems to be doing better than others. And especially the Jews from Russia. And it's not only the coronavirus, which is just hitting Russia, but the steep drop in oil prices, the Russian economy depends mm -hmm. on it. And so there's a lot of Russian Jews who have actually moved up their aliyah. More than 900 new immigrants have arrived in just the last month. The Jewish agency, which is responsible for aliyah, expects more than a thousand by Passover. Given the current situation, they have prepared this video to help newcomers through the process. It was a very strict process and we prepared them. They have to sign the legal document that they are declaring that when they land to Israel, they will go to quarantine. Once landing in Ben Gurion Airport, they go through a digital process where they get the Tudat Tole Dole certificate on the WhatsApp, going home to quarantine. And when they're finishing the 40 days of quarantine, they go to Israel and Krita and to claim the entire uh, benefits and rights that are waiting for them in Israel. During the 1991 Gulf War, new immigrants received gas masks due to the threat of chemical warfare. Shai Felber of the Jewish Agency says such events don't stop Aliyah. Every crisis brings its own opportunity. And we estimate that after this crisis, many, many people in Jewish communities around the world will suffer from economical problems. Obviously, we know in Italy, in other places. And I estimate that if Israel will overcome this crisis from the financial point of view, because I'm sure we will overcome the coronavirus itself, then obviously people will come to live in Israel. The Bible says God will bring his people back to Israel from around the globe. And apparently even a worldwide pandemic won't stop it. Up next, the miracle of Shalva, the world's largest facility for the disabled right here in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is home to the world's largest facility for the disabled. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell talked with its founder, Rabbi Kalman Samuels, about what has become known as the miracle of Shalva. Rabbi Kalman Samuels, we're in Shalva, which is the largest facility of its kind in the world. Tell us what is Shalva and how did it get to this point? It's an organization that my wife and I set up many years ago and its source of that name is biblical. It's Psalms 122 verse 7. May there be peace in your walls, shalva, serenity, within your palaces. We chose that name because what we desire to do in this organization 
is to provide serenity and peace of mind for people who don't have it. But it started with your son, Yossi. Tell us about that. Our second child, Yossi, at the age of 11 months, was taken by Malki to a public health center to get a routine vaccination. And unbeknown to her and unbeknown to the community, they were having problems with a batch of that vaccine. Yossi was injured and he became blind, deaf, and very hyperactive. So our lives got flipped on its head. And seven years later, we were witness to the Helen Keller miracle where Yossi got suddenly a breakthrough to communication when a woman in the deaf school spelled the word table in Hebrew letters in the palm of his hand and he suddenly realized that that was this object. He quickly learned how to spell. He was then taught how to speak Hebrew synthetically. And my dear wife sat me down and said, it's payback time. I made a promise that if God ever helps, I will dedicate my life to other women. God has helped and I want to set up a center to help these youngsters. It started with six children in one garden apartment. Malki ran the programs. By this time I was in the computer field and it kept growing in leaps and in bounds. And today indeed we serve over 1,000 people a day from birth all the way to adulthood and with their families providing quality of life to them and their families. And as you can hear, this place rocks. It, does. it rocks 24 well, I can 7. Tell. And also, Shalva has made world news not long ago. The Shalva band played for Eurovision, where literally hundreds of millions of people saw the Shalva band. Tell us about that. The goal of all our programs at Shalva is to focus on abilities and not on disabilities and try to maximize those abilities. Uh, over a decade ago, we began a music program designed to create a band, which we thought would be a nice in-house band. And we took kids with musical ability who were younger, older, and we took a, a great musical director, and he began to work. Last year, they were invited to play on Israel's version of America Has Talent. They rocked and they knocked off the competition. They got to the finals. Having done so, they would have been able to play in Eurovision as contestants, except that the finals fell on the Sabbath. And some of the children are religious kids and they couldn't play. So the whole band decided we're not playing. It was huge news when they withdrew. But then the Eurovision folks came back and said, we'd like them to play as guest artists at Eurovision. So they sang A Million Dreams from The Greatest Showman at Eurovision in front of more than 200 million people and it made waves all through Europe with the BBC and everybody else featuring this band. But it's not about us, it's about every one of us as human beings. That we have to have our dreams, we have to follow our dreams, and with God's help, these dreams can come true. Still ahead, the discovery of a unique underground system near the Temple Mount from Second Temple Times. A discovery in Jerusalem just before Jerusalem Day revealed a unique underground system carved into the bedrock from the Second Temple period. Even though the Western Wall remains under COVID-19 restrictions, archaeologists are still at work. The latest dig deep underneath the entrance to the Western Wall tunnels uncovered a unique treasure dating back to the time of Jesus. From outside, it looks like a modern white door, but open it up and it's a gateway to history. Like much of Jerusalem, civilization is built on civilization, even carved into the bedrock. Most of the buildings that we know from this uh, time period were stone built, you know, were uh, on the street level. And in here we're finding, you know, this uh, really impressive and unique rock cut uh, system. The rock cut system from the second temple time was completely covered by a Byzantine era mosaic floor that's part of a monumental public structure built about 1400 years ago. It was renovated about 150 years later. Last January, we started to excavate and we started to dismantle the mosaic itself in order to find the earlier remains to this building. Dr. Barack Monacan Dam Givon, the site's co-director, says archaeology 
archaeologists noticed a great attention to detail in the subterranean structure. And those details showed us, the archaeologists, that this system was used uh, in, on a daily basis. Uh, it may have been used as a pantry, you know, so people stored their grocery or olive oil or wheat and barley. Or what is more possible, that it was used, you know, for daily life. People actually lived here. The site is also located about half a football field from the Temple Mount and only 40 feet from the huge bridge that connected ancient uptown Jerusalem to the Temple Mount. Basically what we have here is a window to the way you know, the women, men, and children of ancient Jerusalem during the time of the temple lived. And we're finding here a very unique way of living that was not really familiar to archaeologists working on this uh, time period or in this area. Archaeologist Michael Chernin said artifacts from the dig also attest to the history here, like this chalk cup. The finding of vessel of this kind show us that here in this area there was a Jewish population in this area because uh, vessels of this, of this kind was used only by the Jewish. Other finds included the rim of a huge expensive pot like those at the wedding in Cana when Jesus turned the water into wine. The revelation comes on the eve of the Jerusalem Day anniversary when Israel reunited the city and regained control over the Temple Mount just 53 years ago. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And from all of us here at Jerusalem Dateline and CBN News, we want to pray that you have a blessed, happy, and healthy new year. And remember, the God that's watching over Israel and you and me neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.